Ah, when I was a young lad, my dad said to me, Son, come along to the horse fair with me. Up in the morning, the way we will go, and we'll take the long road for Val and the snow. We set out at daybreak in the cool October air. We passed the traveling people all going to the fair. We then went through Kilrickel, it wasn't far to go. To reach the town of Ockram, that made history long ago. And as we jogged through Brighton up the outskirts... I'm coming to the fair since I was a small child, so I won't tell you how long that is, but it's more than three decades. It's a very important part of life in the west of Ireland. My grandmother is from just outside Glenamadi in a village called Clumahora in Galway and it was always part of her family tradition to come to the fair as it is for most people who have an agricultural background in Galway and Mayo and I suppose it was the time of year to clear the horses because the winter is coming and you can't afford to keep feed young horses and that tradition is still continued today here in Ballinasloe and it's great to come every year and mark the end of the summer season and face into the winter. I was uh, the chairperson of the, of the fair uh, in, in the 90s and we had uh, Mary Robertson uh, came down here and she opened the fair actually here in, in uh, just where we are now, uh, right in the green. He had Michael D then. He came um, when he was uh, a minister and there again he was the one that came up around the green and went and met all the people and, and then last year uh, he came back again as as president and he made a speech which it was second to none. Well first of all um, it's a unique event that is able to sustain 300 years. Yes it has changed but it's a credit to the people down through those years that kept it going. Um, I believe it was an MP years ago after the Battle of Akram that bought ground to uh, facilitate the first horse fair. Ironically enough that MP was voting um, on a bill years ago, no more than Brexit is hanging over us at the moment and it's good to see uh, people from the UK here. Well there's, there's no horse fairs as big as this like this in England and we do have horse fairs but this is huge and it's, my memories of this place is to stand on the bridge up there, over there and look down and see the, the sea of horses everywhere you know it's, it's a good experience to come here, great. I've been coming to the fair since I was a knee knee height to a grasshopper and uh, it's a serious serious fair for the people of the west of Ireland for Banlaslow and for the whole of Europe it's the biggest fair in Europe you can buy anything here at the fair the history of Banlaslow uh, it has name from the uh, Irish of Bailan the Slua which means the mouth of the ford of the crowds or Slua crowds or and uh, that's where it last name. And the fair would have sprung from that as well because it, before there was bridges on the River Suck, people from Linster and Connacht met there to trade their enemies. And uh, the vision fair long before it was patented in 1772 by the King of England. And the reason fairs were patented was so the English people would know that it was a big fair. The fact that it was so big, that's why it was patented. Some other fairs weren't patented, but this one was a right patent. In 1772. Yeah, the first year I was here in 1959, I remember buying a pool at £17. It was the place to sell a horse or to buy a horse because you could have your horse fitted here as well, which was a big advantage. It was one of the fairs, I think it's the only fair where you could have your horse fitted. This is one of the oldest horse fairs in uh, Europe. Maintaining that tradition is really important. In fact, I think the fair in and of itself is probably very essential to the health of horses all over Ireland because of the trading of the uh, different stocks and all. You get that genetic diversity and that's important for the, the health of um, the horses in general. The horse fair is one of a kind. We don't have it in, in Belgium. We have a small one, but it's, it's too strict. It's not so open-minded as over here. Here you can do everything, you can show everything. Uh, and that's, that's the pity with us. 
so if you want to ride a horse, you can ride a horse here, you can test it, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can buy it, you can ship it, everybody's here, so it's fun, it's family atmosphere. The big difference is at the sales, the person that's buying them only gets a couple of minutes to make up their mind when they're under the auctioneer's hammer. They have their mind made up to sell them, they only get three minutes. Whereas at the fair, they can be tried on the fair green and they get a lot more time to make up their mind whether they're buy them or sell them, whichever way they want to. The deals that are done are done in the traditional way, as they were done years ago. It's two people meeting, one man owns the horse, one man wants to buy the horse, and they get into their own conversation, and uh, that's the way the deal is done. And they might spend quite a while arguing, or it looks to be arguing, but it's not really arguing about whether the horse is worth this or that or how much. And at some stage, two minds come together and the deal is done, and a slap on the hand seals it. But the horse of bought in Benham Slow Fair, October Fair, and the cabin men sold the horse. And he was brought up after Malahide, and Herbert McDowell trained. And in 1947, he won the Grand National. 20 lengths at 100 to 1. And the horse won it the year before that, was leading. And Kahu, and Kahu bet him. And that was, it was great excitement. But that was the year I was born, 1947. I had a very good coloured horse. And the same year the president came down, what you call her, the lady, Mary Robinson, yeah. And I had to bring him back down the second, the second day into lunge him again, like, you know. So I was hoping that he'd go as good as he went the first time, but he did, like, you know. It looked look good like for the crowd like you know. Going back years ago, yeah, I think I come on here with, with a pony oh, 50, 60 years ago, I had a mouse colored pony and there was a, a great man from uh, uh, the north of Ireland, Monkey McGovern. He also ride a lovely white mare that he bought very near my place in Loch Ray. And he bought the pony uh, and gave me 120 pounds for him. I was the happiest young lad that ever went back from Loch Ray. When I went home, my parents didn't come to the fair uh, because they thought I was cracked, because I was buying those ponies and horses and breaking them and making them, and then selling them again. So uh, they've been very good to me. The Ballinslow Fair has been very much part of my life. My father's a tinsmith, or was a tinsmith, and one of the oldest tinsmiths in the West. And uh, so, Coming to the fair every year, he would sell, you know, his buckets, his wheelbarrows, his bins. The fair was fundamental for our community because it was a meeting place. It was a meeting place for our families that mightn't have met maybe only once a year. And as a child, my memories of the bar top wagons, the different colours, the reds, the blues, the, the greens, those colours are very, very um, important because they are our traveller main care colours. So the red is the blood that runs through our veins, the green is the grass we walk under, and the blue is the blue of the sky that, where our nomadic roots come from. So living in a town which has the oldest fair in Europe, and this year is 300 years, it's amazing to be part of it. I'm so proud to be part of it. I remember years ago, um, people brought stock to fairs around this country to walk to them. If you go back in the history of this, in 1856, I think, not alone horses, but um, this was the gateway from the west to the east in selling stock for the people that were in tenancies. And this was a barometer. You didn't need an economist to know how a country was going. It depended on the trade that was going here. And I think something like 20,000 cattle went through here in 1856 and 100,000 sheep. Um, now they're talking that there was a backlog of 100,000 cattle and they're all high up on their high horses about it. Um, and people bear in mind at that time there was no tractors and there was no triple deckers or none of this fancy gear we have nowadays. They had to walk them. They came from the different parts of the west of Ireland um, and didn't moan or groan about it because we have to remember there was only a few bridges across the west at the time. Because there's no fair in Europe like this. They talk about fairs in, in England, but you only get a certain type of animal in it, but you get everything here. You know, everything, everything is sold here in Ballinasloe. It is the best fair in Europe. 
In Manistow, when the armies came to buy horses, they bought one particular horse that was an Irish draft horse. And the Irish draft is here today with us all the time, used for different purposes now for sport and recreation. But that time, an uh, Irish draft horse was very dual purpose for the, for the armies of the time because the horse head was so agile, was able to carry a man into battle or he was able to be taken out of that job and he'd pull gunnery on the battlefields. That's why he was so sought, sought after by all armies at the time when horses were used in warfare. Uh, well, as long as I was able to walk, I'd say I was brought into the fair. It was, it was a huge part of our life growing up because we were, all our family was immersed in horses and at that stage it was all half-bred horses. To all of us have a, a couple of horses to get ready for the fair. So it was, it was a huge part of our lives preparing horses for a fair and as, as, as things transpired it became my business in, in later years but I have to say I learned it all here. Uh, I'm Johan know, de Moor, I have a company in breeding horses and selling horses in Belgium. Uh, I'm dealing horses and ponies here for about 20, 15, 20 years. Uh, most of them on, on the sales in Ireland um, and for the rest yeah we try to have some profit somewhere and find a way to find easy going horses for the amateurs that's a bit what I'm doing uh, so Ireland is fun there is always the opportunity when you come to places like this if you look at the new the, the, the opportunity in the line of the lunging ring there where there are people from different countries I believe there's 50,000 given for one animal here well that's that's going to be a lifeline to some person in the west of Ireland and this is where you get the opportunity no more than a singer if they go to enough of places a good singer will be spotted no more than a good horse if the right person is there that, that sees them that's what's required and that'll give encouragement for someone else to continue there um, I am Pierre Edouard and uh, I, I am from uh, chalon sur loire in France and uh, here is Gilles and he's, he's come, uh, he comes from uh, chalon sur loire as well. We, as, as we are invited, uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, we can go everywhere as uh, the IPs. <laughs> so uh, it's very interesting to, to see all of those uh, people, all of those horses and uh, that's quite uh, very interesting, yeah. yeah. But I started my life, my home was on Duggan Avenue, which led up to the fair green. So when we were children, we just loved when fair, October fair came around. I have relations, my mother's family just lived about three miles off the road in Clintuskert. And they used to come in very early in the morning to the fair. So my dad would get a bang on the door about seven o'clock, when they'd be looking for the cup of tea and whatever. And then my father, it was like a ritual on a Sunday morning, the opening Sunday of the fair, my dad would bring us collectively up to the fair green, stop on the top of Church Hill and just look down and it was just a sense of amazement when you look down at that many horses on the green. Obviously at that stage it hadn't, it's not as professional as it has become now. You'd have lorries parked places, you'd have caravans, you'd have stuff like that but I mean the amazing thing to see was the amount of horses that we'd be looking at. And then all day long we'd have traffic going up and down the street, you'd hear the noise of the horses on the tarmac and of course Unfortunately, the one thing that my mother dreaded was the, what was left behind after the horses. So my mum would be coming out with disinfectant and cleaning up after them and obviously saying a few little words that we wouldn't like to hear. In those days where you saw us stay overnight, sometimes we'd come on a Saturday evening and maybe end the year on Monday evening. Uh, to, in latter years, I suppose, transport and all has improved. I haven't stayed here for, I suppose, the last 30 years now maybe. Home, you get a better night's sleep at home. <laughs> I remember one time uh, the people coming with the soft top wagons, the travellers would be coming, they'd be coming a week in advance. That doesn't happen now, of course, but there's still a few diehards still left. Uh, I can remember as a child, you know, the fair green, the time the old Tinker caravans were parked up there in their circles. And, but for me, the most beautiful memories I can remember as a young little boy, when the fairs were on the main street here and especially on the Monday, which was the big horse fair, the street would be just jammed with horses. But of course, while men were trying to hold our horses and maybe do a little bit of bargaining and everything like that, they would get a little bit thirsty. 
and the wife wanted to come to my mother who ran the pub for a little bit of a thirst quencher, which would be some little drink. And of course, we were always there on hand to hold the horses. And it was a very, very big thrill to be out there on the street holding the big horse and uh, waiting for a buyer to come along. I was about 20 years old and there was a guy seven foot tall and he had a, a spotted stallion, 18 ants. And uh, I said to him, how much do you want for your stallion? He said, a thousand euros. <laughs> I said, you wouldn't take 500, but bear in mind the guy was seven foot tall. I didn't know he was going to kill me or pull my arm off. <laughs> anyway, he pulled my arm off and I bought it. <laughs> we took him home and he was breeding with thoroughbred mares for a long time. He was very, very successful. You know, he, he, he your job was to spot a buyer. If you, you spot a buyer from a distance and you know what he's buying and you try and cross his path in front of him and, and, and that carried forth in life, you know, to, uh, to my current business, you know. Well, I grew up on Main Street in Ballinasloe and like the excitement in building up to the fair week, seeing the fun fair come in, we always call the fun fair Toffs, and seeing that come into town uh, kind of highlighted that the fair was going to be on. And when I was a child, uh, growing up, we got the whole week off school. So. In some ways, Fair Week was like nearly like Christmas to us, like we were that excited about it coming around that time of year. And my memory would be on the first Sunday, waking up to the sound, all the horses running up uh, Main Street to get to the Fair Green, because that time they wouldn't have been brought in on lorries. They did maybe someone had parked outside the town and then run their horses in through the town. It was a, an absolutely spectacular thing to see as a child living over the shop on Main Street. Well, it was as a child. It's the hurdy-gurdies, the toughs, that's the attraction down there and to my kids are getting older now but that was the thing when you were a young child, that, that's what you want to go. And what I remember then is a lot of wet days uh, on ponies here and it was lovely if you were on a good one and you hoped you were on a good one, you'd sell it very quick and so you got a bit of a buzz and you might have got a fiver for selling it or something like that but it was, so it gives a huge sense of get this thing sold and we can go to the hurdy-gurdies, you know, so that's what I was talking about, it, it was such an education. I remember my earliest memory was coming in and my mother brought me to the little roundabout. I was only, I'd say, four, four or five. And there was one of the local men here in Banislaw who became my boss later on in years called the late Roger Mulvehill. And his daughter was the same age as me. And funnily enough, our paths always intertwined all through the years because my, uh, Roger saw that I was beside my mother and he came over and he said to my mother, can Nora go up in the roundabout with Norma because she's afraid? So that was my earliest memory of, of the Toffs Fun Fair and the fair. But all through the years then, I would school with Norma. I worked in Norma's uh, bakery. We worked years later here in Glan. So the Mulvehills would be very, very um, important part of my life. And that was my earliest memory of the fair. As I bought my first house for 10 pounds off the uncle and brought him home and trained him and kept him for a year and a half and sold him at Loch Fair for £55 and I never looked back since, thank God. My mother would have a and b for years and she's retired from it now but the people that came, they still come and they still stay in our house, they come from Wales every year and they would never miss a fair, like there's two brothers, a husband and wife and their daughter and son and they come every year and like even though my mum doesn't do B&B anymore they still come and stay with us for that weekend because they wouldn't miss the fair. And that just shows you what it means to people from all over the world. So what a special event it is. My granddaughter was Queen of the Fair. I think just 2018, she was Queen of the Fair. That sure meant a lot to me, you know, to have her on the stage and have her tipping around in the pubs at night and doing a bit of singing. And, and there's one interesting story in here that uh, when the French armies were here buying horses, that they bought a horse who became the mount of um, Napoleon, and the horse's name was Moringa. And that the, the horse was bought in Manistow at that time. The fair in general is, is the people you meet. People you meet from overseas, from Europe, people from America. I've met friends from all over the world here. Um, I have a son of mine out in Korea, a blacksmith came here to Banislow, loved the horses and with his dad and he's took, taken up a, a livelihood in, in, in blacksmithing in Korea. I bought a pony myself here and I sold him to a lady down in Kilkenny, uh, Mary Madonna. And I gave three and a half grand for him here and she gave me a good price for him. And she's 
looking for 200 grand from now. He is a pony that will win a gold medal. He definitely will win a gold medal. Long, long days and a big commitment for a week every year, but it's fantastic to be part of it. And a lot of the horses that um, end up in Dublin come out of places and fairs like Ballinasloe. So, um, you know, you, you see something on a head collar here on the fair green today, and in a year or three years, you might see it in the Simmons Court in Dublin Horse Show competing so that's special as well to get stories like that from people to hear about where their horses came from. Well it's all turbot to have now I buy I buy um, foals and here in Ireland and England and France and, and bring them back and sell them as three-year-olds. Been lucky enough to sell Sizing John and a few Sizing Europe and he won a, a Cheltenham Gold Cup and um, but it, it all goes back to the exact same thing and it was learned here a lot of it was learned here so that's what I love about the fair, that it is inclusive. You know, it doesn't push travellers aside. It, it doesn't just kind of, oh, it's just for the settler community. It's not, it is inclusive. And it's what you bring to the fair is what you get out of it. You come with a good attitude, you'll go home with a good attitude. You come with a negative attitude, that's what you're going to go home with. So that's why it's important to embrace all that is good about Panasol Fair and Festival, and especially this 300 years. That's the thing, as, as just about everyone has passed, we'll go, all right, we'll take it. <laughs> because they are the quality of horses is, is they're again incredible and that's one of the reasons also that we came just for the fair. We have some fun, we have some holiday and we have some business. So we combine the two. It's been a huge part of my life and I, I love it even, I don't keep any half red horses now, it's all Herbert but I wouldn't miss this. I had spent three days in here every year and I would hate to miss it, I would hate to miss it. You, you have to judge your um, who you're buying from as well and you have to be able to, to judge the horse and judge the man that's selling the horse. And um, the odd mistake makes you open your eye a bit better. Um, that's part of it. The atmosphere for some of the people would be a holiday more so than buying horses just to see because it's advertised all over Europe, all over the world really. And a lot of people come and they have never seen anything like it where you see a couple of thousand horses in a field for sale. I would say to the people that hasn't come to the fair, they don't know what they're missing. They don't know what they're missing. And like, it's, it's the talk of the place. It's the talk of the place. And people that come here to the fair can't wait for next year's fair. You, you don't have to sell the Bannerslow Fair. Bannerslow Fair is selling itself. <laughs>